and welcome to the Cradle of Aviation Museum. My name is Katherine Gonzalez and I'm the Education Director here at the museum. We're so excited to have you here today as part of our special year-long celebration we're calling Countdown to Apollo at 50, okay? Woohoo! Yeah! yeah. So today we are thrilled to present retired Navy captain and former astronaut Hoot Gibson. Hoot has roots on Long Island as both a graduate of Huntington High School and of Suffolk Community College. With a degree in aeronautical engineering, he entered the Navy and as a result has logged more than 6,000 hours in aircraft. From there, Hoot became an astronaut and was on five space shuttle missions where he was the pilot of those missions. And he'll be able to talk with you about that today. Not only has he explored the clouds above us, but he's gone beyond and into space, and I'm sure he'll make some astronauts out of you guys today, too. So please join me in welcoming Hoot Gibson. Well, good morning. Who thinks space is exciting? Right. We're going to talk about space here for a little bit, and I'm going to hurry through a bunch of slides and then save time for questions. So be thinking of questions for me, uh, but let's let me get through all the slides and then we'll start doing questions. Well, this is just a pretty picture of a space shuttle, and this, as you can see, is the space shuttle Discovery. Guess what? I never flew it, but that's the only one I didn't fly. I flew Challenger on my first launch, and this was a picture of me launching in Challenger long time ago, 1984, and this was the tenth time that we had sent a space shuttle to orbit, and I was the co-pilot on that mission, and the other four missions that I flew, I was the mission commander. But this was my first launch, and this is where we are at the end of two minutes. Now, it looks like in this picture that we're going down, doesn't it? We're not actually going down. You know what we're doing? We're following the curvature of the Earth. So we're still going uphill. But where are we at the end of two minutes? We are 30 miles up, 30 miles out over the Atlantic Ocean, and we're already going 3,000 miles an hour in the space of just two minutes. It only takes us eight and one half minutes to get to space. You can't get back to the buses in eight and a half minutes from here. <laughs> but in that amount of time, we're going how fast? 17,500 miles an hour. This is what was happening right in that last picture we have burned out the two booster rockets, and then we're going to separate those, because those are empty now. They're not putting out any more thrust. And so we drop those off, and those would come down in the ocean under parachutes. They'd get retrieved by two ships, and we would reuse them. We'd fill them up with fuel and reuse them. So that was the only part that we didn't throw away. We did this on my first mission. Now, people ask me all the time, who, is this you? And say, no, no, but no doubt you've wondered who was the excellent photographer that took that photo. Okay, it was me. And the joke I like to tell is, as the co-pilot on my first mission, I was the only person on the crew who knew how to work a camera. No, I was the only person on the crew that had absolutely nothing to do during the spacewalk. So I took this photo, and the other joke I like to tell is that the reason that pilot astronauts don't get to do spacewalks is I am way too valuable to risk me outside. But we've got lots of mission specialists, and we can send them all out, and if they don't all come back, no big deal. Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's to, it's to divide up the amount of training time. As a pilot, we spent so much time training on launch, aborts, reentry, landing, rendezvous, docking malfunction procedures, vehicle systems, to even out the training time, the mission specialists get to do all the spacewalks. Well, I'm glad I got to be a pilot, astronaut, because I got to be a mission commander. But when I saw this, which was the world's first untethered spacewalk, you notice in this picture, there's no ropes tying him to the shuttle. He's not tethered at all. He's going to use the rocket backpack that he's wearing to fly in space and he went pretty far away. Now, the other question I get all the time is, okay, what if he runs out of fuel? What if he has an electrical failure in his rocket pack? The answer is, we could fly Challenger over to pick him up if he promises us enough money. 
and we're going to agree on a price before we come to get you. Well, nothing like that happened. It was absolutely flawless. And I have to admit, I'm glad I got to be a mission commander and a pilot astronaut, but when I looked out the window and saw this, I was jealous. Think of the view he's got under his boots. The Earth is 185 miles under his feet, and he's crossing the Earth at five miles per second. Five miles per second. There's not a Corvette on Earth that'll go that fast. So really an exciting place to be. For my final mission, I got to train over here. Where's this? Russia. Yes, Russia. This is Red Square and the Kremlin and what was Lenin's tomb. I got to train over there because my final mission, I went here. This was the Russian space station Mir. And what was more challenging about this mission than the flying part was that I had to attempt, underline the word attempt, I had to attempt to learn to speak Russian. And the reason, I'm not good at languages, because I are an engineer. <laughs> Engineers ain't taught good in English, let alone in Russian. So it was a struggle for me to attempt to learn to speak Russian. But I needed to be able to speak Russian, because for the first and the only time in history, we did a Russian crew changeout. I carried Anatoly Soloviev and Nikolai Budarin with me aboard Atlantis when we launched, and they couldn't speak English. And Russia was so poor back then, they could not afford English teachers or English textbooks. So we had to attempt to learn to speak Russian. And for an engineer, that's not easy. I'm pretty good with physics and math and those things. So here's what I know best in Russian. And any time I'm going to talk to somebody in a Russian conversation, I will start off with this so they won't be expecting too much. What I just said was, I speak Russian very badly and understand nothing. <laughs> so I will always say that to start off. But I mentioned I have Anatoly and Nikolai on board with me who don't speak English. What if I needed to tell them something like, Excuse me, please. We have a small fire on board right now. So we needed to be able to talk to them. Well, I am not fluent. I am far from fluent. But what little Russian I did learn, I've pretty much got for life, I think. So I can still carry on a very poor conversation in Russian. Well, where I docked was on this end of the space station on a docking port that the Russians had built for their space shuttle to go to, but it never went there. They only flew their space shuttle one time, way back in 1988, completely unmanned, and it never flew again. So we bought the part that we needed, the docking adapter, which is this round circular thing that you see up here in the cargo bay. We bought that from the Russians and adapted it to the space shuttle so that I could dock with the Russian space station. Now this was the very first time ever that a space shuttle had done a docking. And I'm flying Atlantis by hand at this point because rendezvous and docking is flown manually by the commander in our space program. In the Russian program it's automated. So it automatically flies the docking for them and they back it up. They train to fly it themselves if they have to. But what I had to do was line up our docking ring with their docking ring up here on the station. And they said, Hoot, you can be sloppy. You just have to line them up within three inches. <laughs> so we're both going 17,500 miles an hour. And I have to be able to line them up within three inches. Well, training pays off. We had done nearly 100 dockings in the simulator. So it came off without a hitch. And when we got there, the plan was the two mission commanders will shake hands at the hatch. So in this picture, I'm shaking hands with the Russian commander, Vladimir Dezhurov, who had been a Russian fighter pilot training to shoot me down, while I had been an American Navy fighter pilot training to shoot him down. And the two of us met at the hatch and shook hands. And the President of the United States announced that day that this handshake marks the end of the Cold War. So now you can all tell your friends you met the person 
who ended the Cold War. That was me. I ended the Cold War. Makes, makes a funny story. Well, we were docked to the space station for five days, and this is what we looked like while we were docked to it. And the way we got this photo, the two astronauts that I carried to space, the two cosmonauts, Anatoly and Nikolai, took over the space station, and I picked up three who had been there for four months and gave them a ride home. This was the only time ever that we did a Russian crew change out with an American spacecraft. And so the way we got this photo, Anatoly and Nikolai climbed into their Soyuz spacecraft, which had been docked up here, maneuvered out to the side 60 meters away, or 200 feet away, so they could take this photo, and they took this photo as we were leaving. Now, we flew around them three times. We made three big circles around them so we could get photos of the station to see what kind of shape it was in. Uh, because at that point, the oldest portions of the station had been in space for nine years. And so we wanted to characterize what kind of shape is this place in after nine months in or after nine years in orbit, uh, because we were working on an international space station, and so it was going to give us a head start to see. This is what it looked like as we were circling around them and saying goodbye <coughs> to the space station. Well, we spent two more days in orbit and then came back down and landed. And I didn't mention until just now, this shirt that I'm wearing went to space with me on that mission. So it's had 10 days in space. And they let us keep our shirts after the mission. We don't get to keep anything else. I didn't get to keep the spacesuit or the flight boots or any of that stuff, but I got to keep this cool shirt. What does this look like? Hurricane. Yes, very good. We took this picture on my fourth mission, and this was Hurricane Bonnie out over the Atlantic Ocean near Bermuda. This was in September of 1992. And you can very clearly see the eye of the hurricane and all these spiral bands of thunderstorms and tornadoes that wrap out from around a hurricane. This is a good place to see hurricanes from, is up in space, not down here. Not quite as much fun down here. This was a picture that we took on my fourth mission as well. And what we're looking at is the delta of the Nile River. So to the right side of the photo, that's the Mediterranean Sea. So north is this direction over here because the Nile, as we know, flows from the south to the north. And you can see the delta of the Nile River is just huge. It's really huge. Now from space, the only things that are colored silver or gray are cities. So this right here is Cairo, Egypt, the capital of Egypt. Underneath the tail, of the space shuttle, you can see the Suez Canal. It cuts from the Mediterranean Sea into the Red Sea, and that's what allows shipping to travel through the, the Suez Canal and get to the Indian Ocean without having to sail around the southern tip of Africa. So that's the Suez Canal. And the bright spot in the sand right here, those are the pyramids. So you can actually spot those from space if you know right where to look. OK, what do you suppose this looks like at night? Wow. It looks pretty spectacular at night. So not only do we get to enjoy this view in the daytime, we get to enjoy the view at night as well. Now you can see there sure are a lot of people that live along the Nile River from all the lights we can see. Tons of civilization along the Nile River, because we humans need water very badly. Uh, Cairo is very brightly lit up at night. There's a lot of people that live in the Delta. This is Alexandria, Egypt, right here. Now, you move off the Nile River a little bit, there's not so much out there. I have no clue who this is out here. But you guys sure are way out there. So anyway, just a real pretty picture. Uh, okay, I got another photo for you. I think the next picture is someplace you have to guess where this is, okay? This is going to be a tough one now. This is really difficult. Okay, it's not so difficult at all, is it? Anyway, pretty picture of Italy and Sicily, of course. And one of the interesting things in this picture, again, it is so fascinating because we get to watch this view of the Earth at night as well. But one of the interesting things in this picture 
This is a reflection. These little green lights are a reflection in the, in the glass of the space shuttle. But this little band on the horizon, any guess what that might be? What is that? That's our air. That's Earth's atmosphere. It's about 85 miles thick. And at night, it takes on some of the ambient light and it forms what we astronauts refer to as the air glow. So that's Earth's atmosphere. 85 miles thick, that's what makes it possible for we humans to survive here on Earth. Okay, the next picture. I was talking to a, a school one time and I said, okay, the next picture that I'm going to show you is the most gorgeous thing that we get to see from space. And one of the kids yelled out, Las Vegas. No. No, not Las Vegas. Oh, wait a minute, I'm one picture off. Uh, sunrises and sunsets. We get to see lots of sunrises and sunsets, and the reason for that is that we're circling the Earth in an hour and a half. It only takes us 90 minutes to go all the way around the Earth in orbit. So therefore, we are 45 minutes in the dark, 45 minutes in daylight, 45 in the dark, 45 daylight. The sun goes up and down 16 times a day when we're up in space. So in no time at all, you have no idea what day it is down on the Earth because you have seen so many sunrises and sunsets. And they're happening 16 times as fast as what we see here on the Earth. Okay, the next slide is the prettiest thing that we get to see. Not Las Vegas. Yes, the northern lights. But not only do we get to see the northern lights, the aurora borealis, which you probably know is a ring of light around the North Pole. There's also an aurora australis, the southern lights, a ring of light around the South Pole. So if we're in an orbit that takes us far enough north to see the aurora borealis, it's also going to take us down south to where we can see the aurora australis. And it's just fascinating to watch because it looks like it's alive. It's moving, it's changing altitude, it's changing colors. It's just fascinating. Over the years, we've trained mission control. Hey, if we're up north by the aurora, or we're down south by the aurora, don't even bother to call us. Nobody's going to talk to you. We're all at the window looking at the aurora. So we've trained them that way over the years. OK, re-entry. When we would come back into land, what we did was we would turn around backwards and fire our rocket motors to slow us down by only about 300 miles an hour from our 17,500 miles an hour. That puts us on a trajectory that intercepts the Earth's atmosphere. And it's the drag of the Earth's atmosphere that slows us down the rest of the way to our landing speed. Now, in the course of that, what happens is we create this immense, powerful shock wave, supersonic shock wave in the air. And this is a wind tunnel model of a space shuttle. And this is how we would fly re-enter. We'd be 40 degrees nose up, and we'd hit the air still going 17,300 miles an hour. And we create this powerful shock wave in the air. That shock wave is 9,000 degrees in temperature. There's not a metal on Earth that'll survive that. So around the orbiter, we had what was called a thermal protection system that was not metal, that was capable of protecting us from the heat of reentry. And this is what it looked like from inside when you were flying reentry. It looks like you're flying into a blowtorch because the 9,000 degree air looks like it's on fire. It's glowing, it's red hot, white hot, so re-entry was pretty exciting as well. The launch was exciting, as was the re-entry. And then, when we get down into the thick atmosphere, we're a glider. Okay, We're a 230,000-pound glider. So how many tries do we get to land it? One, exactly one. So we train our pilots very, very extensively before he makes his first landing. Uh, hey, wait a minute. What about she? Did we have any space shuttle commanders that were women? Yes, you bet we did. So before he or she would make your first flight as co-pilot, you're going to have about 500 practice landings in the simulator. And before you fly as commander, she or he would have about 1,000 landings in our simulator. 
So we trained our pilots very, very extensively. And the shuttle training airplane is the one you see in this picture at the top of the photo. It was a Grumman Gulfstream, once again, Grumman, Grumman Gulfstream, modified to fly just like the space shuttle so that we could simulate the landing. And it flies just like the shuttle does. So that's the airplane that we all trained in. Now, once you've finished this mission and you had survived the flight, you get to pose for cool hero photos like this one, standing in front of your space shuttle. And this was my final flight. There were actually eight of us on board for the landing. Uh, the three cosmonauts who had been on the space station for four months and five Americans. But what happened was one of my astronauts, Dr. Ellen Baker, who's an astronaut who was from New York as well, uh, grew up in Queens. Uh, she was helping with the three cosmonauts who had been up there for four months. So we put them back into rehabilitation. When you've been in space that long, we're going to put you in rehab. So they're in wheelchairs, and she's helping with them. That's why there's only four of us there. Well, July of 2011, this happened. It's the very last launch of the space shuttle. And this was the space shuttle Atlantis. Went to the International Space Station, taking the last pieces of the things that we needed to build the International Space Station. They were up, I think, 14 days, came back and landed at Cape Canaveral in the dark, as you can see, to close out 135 launches of the space shuttle. 135 times we launched it. To put that number in perspective, our entire space program before the shuttle, which was Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Apollo, Soyuz, and Skylab, was 31 total launches. So that's how many times we had sent Americans to space before the shuttle. And the shuttle launched 135 times. So it really was quite a program. Where are they now? Uh, you probably know where they are. Uh, the Space Shuttle Discovery is on display at the Air and Space Museum out at Dulles Airport near Washington, D.C. And this was a picture of three of my crew members and my wife, who was an astronaut, and they had all flown Discovery. I mentioned to you earlier, I had not flown Discovery, but this was a picture that we took on a crew reunion back to the Washington, D.C. area, and all four of them had flown the Space Shuttle Discovery. The Space Shuttle Atlantis is at Cape Canaveral on display, and this is really a spectacular display as well, uh, which is where Atlantis will remain. The Space Shuttle Endeavor is on display out at the California Science Center in Los Angeles, and it's horizontal right now on display, but they're building a new hangar, a new building, and it's going to be displayed vertically attached to the fuel tank and the booster rockets the way it was when it would launch. So that's where the Space Shuttles are, and you all probably know we have one very nearby here in New York Harbor aboard the aircraft carrier Intrepid, and that's Enterprise, which didn't go to space, but Intrepid did all the, I'm sorry, Enterprise did all the initial glide testing of a space shuttle before we ever launched Columbia for the very first time. So that's where they are, and this is a wider angle picture of Intrepid there in the harbor. Well, a lot of people don't realize, and you all have to make sure that Americans realize that we still have a space program. We still have had a space program ever since we retired the shuttles in 2011, and it's the International Space Station. We have Americans in orbit 365 days a year, every year, aboard the International Space Station. A lot of Americans don't know that because they don't launch from here. They launch from over here, which is over in Kazakhstan with the Russians. So they've been launching aboard the Russian Soyuz rockets for the last seven years and landing aboard the Soyuz capsule. And we pay the Russians $73 million per person to carry our astronauts. Well, thankfully, that's coming to an end very shortly because we will have this vehicle, the... Uh, who makes this? 
Boeing. The Boeing CST-100 Starliner is going to start launching either the end of this year or early next year, carrying our astronauts to the space station. And also, this one, SpaceX, the Crew Dragon. So we will start launching our own astronauts again by the end of this year or early next year. It's going to get really exciting because we'll be launching from Cape Canaveral again. And that's going to be really exciting to see our, our boys and girls launching from here in the U.S. once again. Now, the other thing that NASA is building is this, the biggest rocket ever, the SLS, which stands for Space Launch System. And this rocket is bigger than the Saturn V. And it's due to launch early in 2020, 2020. And it's going to enable us to establish a base on the moon and learn how to operate for a long period of time in space and then branch off to go somewhere else. Now, it's going to be powered by four space shuttle engines on the back of the booster state, on the back of the tank, and then two enlarged space shuttle solid rocket boosters. So that's what it's going to utilize. So it's reusing some of our hardware that we had from the space shuttle program. And these are the places that it's going to enable us to go. It's going to enable us to go beyond Earth orbit. It's going to enable us to establish that base on the moon. And it's going to let us go all the way here. Who'd like to go to Mars? All right, well, I'd love to go. But you know what they're going to tell me? They're going to tell me two things. They're going to say, Hood. Stop being greedy. You already had your turn. You got to fly five times. Haven't you been greedy enough already? But the other thing they're going to tell me is, Hood, you're too old. We need younger people. And so who's going to get to go to Mars, okay? Here's the kind of people that are going to get to go to Mars. I took this picture at space camp. People your age and people the age of space camp attendees are the ones that are going to have an opportunity to go to Mars. And let me tell you, flying in space is really exciting. Between my wife and I, she went three times, and I went five times to space. We flew eight missions in space, and it's a life-changing event, as you might imagine. It is such a spectacular experience. Well, that is my last slide, and I think we've still got, okay, I got through that pretty quickly. We have time for questions. Uh, Greg, if you want, yes, look at that. The lights are voice activated. Uh, so if we have questions for me, uh, I'd be happy to take questions and comments at this point. Anybody have any? You had the first hand up. Yes. Uh, so, was there any malfunctions on your ship? Or oh, yeah, good question. Um, I, mentioned, I mentioned when I was talking about the training that we do a tremendous amount of malfunction training and vehicle system training, there are malfunctions every single day. Every single day when you're up in orbit. The space shuttles have been described as the most complicated machine that we've ever operated. And so it has so many systems in it and so many little parts that things are going to go wrong. So all of the malfunction training that we did was completely realistic because we would have, like I say, malfunctions every day. Something goes wrong. So you have to work it. You have to work the procedure and bring up a backup system in case something has failed. So yeah, it happens all the time. Yes, sir? My uh, seven-year-old son wanted me to ask, um, how long is the countdown really when you're going to, because in the movies it's always 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Oh, nine, sure. Eight. How long is it really? Well, um, on my final mission, the countdown was five and a half hours. That's when I had to climb into the space shuttle. It was five and a half hours because the commander climbs in first. And the reason it was so long, normally it's only about three and a half hours. But even so, three and a half hours, you're in this big, bulky, hot, stuffy pressure suit down in Florida. Does it get kind of warm and humid in Florida? Oh, yeah. And here you are in this great, big, 50-pound pressure suit. And so you'd be laying on your back, basically, okay? Because you're sitting in your seat, okay? Just like all of you are in a seat right now. But now take the space shuttle and point it straight up. 
So you're lying on your back, in my case for the docking mission, five and a half hours working the countdown. So you can't wait for that to be over with. And let's get off to space. So yeah, it, it gets really long. Right up here in the front. Oh, okay. Uh, during launch? Yeah, during the launch, uh, her question was, are you, are you pressed down? Yeah, you are smashed back against your seat because the acceleration during launch is as high as three Gs. You know what a G is? One G is the force of gravity. Okay, that's what all of us are feeling right now is one G, okay, holding us against the Earth. When we launch, you're accelerating at as high as three Gs. So you weigh three times as heavy as you are right now. So it is mushing you. Is that a, is that a technical word, mushing? It is squishing you. That's not a technical word either. You're being pressed back against your seat, and you weigh three times as much as you normally weigh. It's actually a little difficult to breathe because you have to expand your chest against the acceleration. So it's a little bit of effort to inhale. It's easy to exhale, but it's a little bit of effort to inhale. So, but it's quite a ride. Okay, up here has a question. Yes. How old were you when you went to space? How old was I when I went to space? Okay, my first time. You guys are going to figure out how old I am now. Okay, I'm kind of old. I'm 71 now. Okay, but my first launch to space was 1984. So I was not. I was 35 years old when I first went to space. You know, that brings up a question. What do you have to do if you want to be an astronaut? Okay, you have to have a college degree in either engineering, science, or mathematics. Has to be one of those three areas. And you know what? Those are fascinating things to study. Engineering and science and math is what lets us design airplanes. It's what lets us design automobiles. It's what, what, what lets us design spacecraft and it's exciting to be working with Newton's laws of motion and the things that we work with in engineering and math and science. It is really fascinating. So, and then you had to have at least three years of experience in uh, some technical field. And as a pilot, you had to have 1,500 hours of high performance jet time. So jet fighter or jet attack time. Okay, you did have your hand up. I couldn't tell if you were resting your arm or you had your hand up. Do I believe in extraterrestrials? No. We have been searching and searching for life somewhere else. And I'm sure that when somebody says, okay, I saw a UFO. I saw an unidentified flying object. Okay, they saw something. I, I don't know what they saw or what they think they saw. But there have not been any credible sightings of anything that could be considered an alien spacecraft. There just haven't been. And NASA has been diligently searching for life somewhere else. And as big as the universe is, there probably is life somewhere else. We have not found it yet. We're still searching, but we have not found it yet. Yes, over here. Okay, his question is that he saw pictures of something that the Germans built, and I've seen those pictures too, uh, although they never built it. The Germans never built it. Although there are drawings of it, there's pictures that have been put together of it. But um, it's possible that people see things and think they're seeing a UFO. They're seeing a cloud or they're seeing a lenticular cloud or something. But no, there have been no credible sightings whatsoever of anything close to a UFO. Okay, over here. Okay, what did I do in space? Yeah, I didn't tell you a whole lot about that. Uh, on the missions I flew, most of the time we were launching satellites. So the space shuttle was optimized to carry things into Earth orbit. It can't go to the moon. It can't go to Mars. What it was optimized for was to carry payloads up into orbit so on my first flight, we had two satellites. My second flight, we had one satellite. We would drop them off in orbit at about 200 miles up. And then they would fire their own rocket motor and drive up to what we call a geosynchronous or a geostationary orbit, 
22,000 miles above the Earth. And so primarily that's what we were doing. Now my final mission, I showed you, I docked with the Russian space station. That was to really begin the cooperation with Russia and the United States in space. And so that was our mission on that. Okay, uh, next to her, yes, you. <coughs> Have I ever been on, what, another planet? No, the only, have I ever been hovering over someplace else? No, we didn't even go to the moon. Again, the purpose of the shuttle was to carry things into Earth orbit, satellites, and also to do experiments <coughs> involving weightlessness, because when we're in space, we don't have one G holding us down against the ground like we do here on the Earth. So everything can float freely. We've done life sciences research, and we've done material science research up in space. So we don't go to any of the planets, and we don't even go to the moon. Okay, right here in the black. Okay, all right, interesting question. Did you ever have back pains because of being pushed back against the seat? No, you had back pains for a different reason. And what happens to you is when you get in orbit, okay, right now, all of you are being crushed by gravity, right? Gravity is holding us against the earth, so it's compressing our backbone. When we get in weightlessness, your back expands. You fill in between the discs in your back with fluid, water basically, so you stretch. Well, that stretches your lower back muscles. So your first two days in space, you have lower back pain because you will grow as much as an inch and a half taller. Now the other thing that's interesting is that you lose water because your body looks at your fluid balance, which is all out of whack, because right now our fluid balance is being directed by gravity, okay? <coughs> when we get weightless, fluid tends to float up in your body, your face gets real full, and your body says, I've got way too much water. So you get rid of about eight pounds of water. So you come back and land, you're an inch and a half taller, and you're eight pounds lighter. It looks really good on the height and weight charts when you come back and land. So, but that's why you have back pain, is because you've stretched. Yes? I have a question. How did you guys eat your bathroom and shower? OK. All right. That's a three-part question. How did you eat, use the bathroom, and shower? OK. Well, shower is very simple to explain that. There's no shower. You don't get to shower. And so one of the things you really look forward to when you come back is a shower. Now, we can stay clean because later on in the shuttle program, what we had was we had a no-rinse body wash that we could use. And so you didn't have to rinse off. You could scrub off with this using a, 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 a sponge or a washcloth. And you could wash off, and that felt really good. Not quite as good as a shower but you could wash off. And then the same thing with your hair. We had a no-rinse shampoo. That you could wash your hair and then just dry it with a towel. And you could stay nice and clean. Okay, the bathroom. It's a good question, because let's picture this. We have seven people locked up in a space shuttle for 10 days. Do you suppose you need to have a bathroom? Oh yeah, you better have one, and it better work. Okay, now, in space, we don't have something working for us we have down here on the ground, and that's gravity. Gravity does something very good for us when you need to use the bathroom. It makes everything go away from you. Now, up in space, you still want everything to go away from you. So the way we do that, in the absence of gravity doing that, is airflow, okay? We have airflow that is injected into the toilet, right below the toilet seat, and it flows down into a holding tank, okay? And it makes everything go away from you. So that's the way the space toilet works. And it's important because if you've got seven people up in a space shuttle for 10 days, uh, you better have a toilet that works. Okay, in the pink shirt way up there. Oh, say it a little louder. Is the earth flat? I'll bet you know the answer. I'll bet you know the answer. Okay, some of the slides that I showed. Um, did we see any edges? 
in the slides that I showed, no, of course it's round. And, and of course, we know that from orbiting the Earth, from circling the Earth up in orbit. You can, of course, see that it is very definitely round. Okay, in the, in the black shirt. What's your favorite mission you've been on? What's my favorite mission? I guess it would have to be the last one, the mirror docking, uh, because it was really a lot of fun to attempt to learn to speak Russian. And it was a lot of fun to train over in Russia and get to actually see a lot of things that I had studied as a, as a Navy fighter pilot and how to work against the Russians. And it had the biggest challenge, the, the greatest degree of difficulty of any of the other missions that I flew. And it just came off flawlessly. It just came off perfectly. And that's a tribute to the training, uh, the training that we do at NASA. So anyway, that, that would have to be my favorite one. OK, uh, the two young ladies over here on the edge, both of you. One of you first, and then the other one. Um, is your food good? Is the food good? No. Yes, yes. Yeah, the food is actually very good, uh, because yeah, that's good for morale. Uh, if you're up there, and most of the food that we had on the space shuttle was a little different than what the space station uses because we make water on the space shuttle. The way we generated electricity was we had fuel cells. We had three fuel cells on board. Those combine <coughs> hydrogen and oxygen, and that generates electricity. And the byproduct, it's hydrogen and oxygen. The byproduct's H2O. So we make water every day. So we carry dehydrated food, and you'd mix it with water, let it rehydrate for about 15 minutes, and then you could eat it. So the food was very good. Now, my favorite thing was dehydrated shrimp cocktail. Oh, you should have seen what it looked like. It looks even worse than it sounds, because it looks like a bunch of dried cockroaches in some red powder. That's what it looks like, okay? But now you rehydrate it in cold water, and it becomes shrimp cocktail. And it was delicious. I gave myself, because after my third mission, we got to pick our own menu. We had a list to choose from. I gave myself shrimp cocktail for every lunch and every dinner in space. So it looked pretty repulsive. But it was really good. OK, there was another young lady up there. Yep. Oh, golly, to, to build a oh, question was, how long does it take to refill the booster rockets? That was a long process, because what would happen is the booster rockets would land under parachutes in the ocean. They would tow them back into port, and then they would take them all apart. They were made out of four segments. And one of those segments was as big and heavy as a rail car could carry. So they got shipped by rail from Cape Canaveral all the way out to Utah, which is where they would get refurbished and reconditioned, and then shipped back to the Cape. And then those four segments would be put back together. Now, to build a space shuttle, First of all, it's going to cost a lot of money. A space shuttle costs about one and a half billion dollars for the B. And to build the replacement space shuttle for Challenger. You know, we lost Challenger in 1986. We built Endeavour to replace Challenger. That took about a year and a half to build Endeavour. And that's after we already knew how to build it. Uh, so from the initial design, though, of a space shuttle till the first flight was eight years. So it took eight years to design it, develop it, test it, certify it, get ready to launch it, and actually fly it. Uh, so that's the kind of timeline it takes to build something that's going to go to space. How am I doing? OK. OK, over here. Uh -huh. Well, what did you do for entertainment? Watch the Earth go by. We were working pretty hard. What, what we were booked for while we were up in space was a 16-hour workday. And the thing is, you wanted to be as productive as you could possibly be when you went to space. 
So nobody complained about working 16 hours a day. You wanted to accomplish as much as you possibly could. And so you really didn't have time for entertainment. Now, on the International Space Station, people are up there for six months at a time. So they are allowed to bring movies. Um, they have family teleconferences that they get to do and things like that. But aboard the space shuttle, we really just had to entertain ourselves. And that was okay, because watching the Earth go by was pretty fascinating. Okay, over here in the red. Okay, question was, how did other life form? Well, you know what, we haven't found any. Oh, the southern lights. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. The southern lights and the northern lights, you probably all know this, but they are a product of the solar wind, which comes from the sun, okay, and it impacts Earth's magnetic field, and these charged particles hit Earth's magnetic field, and they spiral around the lines of magnetic, what's called magnetic flux, and they enter the North Pole, depending on what charge they are, or they enter at the South Pole, depending on what charge they are. And what causes them to emit light is when they hit the top of Earth's air. So the northern lights and the southern lights are happening at the very top of Earth's air. And so I don't know if you noticed in the picture, but I, and I didn't point it out, but we are up above Earth's air. So when we're in orbit, we actually look down at the aurora because it's down below where we are. But it causes those particles that are spinning around the magnetic lines to emit light. And that's actually what, I'm glad you brought that up. That's what actually causes the northern lights and the southern lights. Okay, they're telling me to shut up. They're saying it's time. Okay, one more, we get one more. Where haven't I called, okay. Um, there's too many of us that want to ask questions. Okay, the one with two hands up. If you could right now, would you go into space again? If I could right now, you bet I would. I was not tired of going. You saw how exciting that was, right? Yes, you saw how exciting that was. I would love to go again. And I thought for a while there I was going to get to work as a private citizen working on a rocket project. Only they didn't get the NASA contract, and I would have been their test pilot and be the one to take their rocket to space for the first time. So if another opportunity like that comes up, I will jump all over it. My wife won't be happy with me, but I will be. So yeah, I would love to go again. I was not tired of it. Uh, it was so exciting. And yet, at the same time, I kind of said to myself, OK, haven't you been greedy enough flying five times. It's time for me to get out of the way and give the younger guys and gals a turn. So that was really the reason that I left. That was the whole reason I left. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this because I sure have.